My name is Samuel Jekam Wako. I'm currently the technical director and head coach of Sports in Portugal's Academy in Toronto. Uh, every day, my day-to-day -day activities act include coaching the coaches and all the teams, making sure everything in the club is done properly and implementing Sporting's philosophy in Toronto. Um, into developing human beings first and players second. Uh, growing up, learning, watching and learning from all great coaches, say Alex Ferguson, Louis Van Gaal, Jose Mourinho, Pep. Uh, I believe taking from everybody and putting together to make my own philosophy as well sets us apart from everybody else. Well, uh, actually, I was an international student in Canada and um, I met a man a while ago who's just by a field started talking and he introduced me to someone who later brought me to Sporting. Uh, his name was Pedro. Pedro moved to Maritimo in Portugal to um, coach and a year later came back and said, told me Sporting was opening an academy in Canada and he wanted to work with me. And I was there as a volunteer, wanting to learn and fast forward, what, how many years now? Eight years, nine years? Yeah. We're here. Okay, so that, that was how it all began in yeah. terms of, you know, being introduced to yeah. uh, the Sporting branch in Toronto. But uh, we know that you do have a background uh, from Ghana as well. And, yes. You know, yeah, you lived here for the most part of your life. Yes. Was, was sports really a part of you? Did you ever consider being a coach? Uh, Take us through like how it all went from childhood straight up until here. I mean, growing up, I always wanted to work in soccer or football, as we call it here. Uh, watched it every Saturday, every Sunday, like everybody else. I always liked playing. Uh, you know, Ghanaian parents never want you to be a coach. <laughs> they, they have different dreams for you. Yeah. Either you're a lawyer or engineer or whatever else. But then it was just a passion that I pursued when I got the opportunity. Uh, watching the game, writing about it, talking about it all the time, arguing with my friends every single time. That's how it was. That's how it was for me. Uh, but then at home, it was totally different, right? Because the conversations you have with your parents about what you want to do in the future is totally different from what you actually want to do when you find your passion. Growing up, I actually wanted to be a pilot. Pilot? Yeah. At what age, at what age was that? That's all I grew up knowing. <laughs> but one thing I also knew was that I always, always, I always wanted to open a soccer academy in Ghana. Okay. Right. And that, as far as seven years old, I knew that. Yeah. So eventually things happened yeah. and I ended up in the soccer industry. But, you spoke of uh, you know volunteering in Canada, yes. being an international student. Can you talk us through your educational experience? Did you go to a school in Canada yes. to become a pilot, or what no. exactly was it? So uh, over here, I went to Presec, and after Presec, I went to York University in Canada. Uh, my major was Public Admin and Justice Studies, yeah. so it was head and toes law, yeah. surprisingly. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's when it, it happened. So from law to sports. I just found my passion, uh, something to kill time, and it just grew from there. Yeah. And what was the experience been like so far? You know, being a coach. Uh, it's it's been amazing. Did, did you you said you started off well, being a volunteer? Yes. Can you you know go through the ladder in terms of like how you climbed up to become coach? So I met Pedro. I worked with Pedro for two months at yeah. Betamar, a different Portuguese club, uh, as his manager. So he does the technical stuff and the coaching, I do the paperwork behind, but my main idea was always learning from him. Uh, so I was always with him, shadowing him, I practice, games, everything. And then he left, I took over the team. Uh, but then when he came back and went to Sporting, it was still the same, just volunteering and shadowing everything he does as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And then from there, when I got a chance to be given a team as the head coach, I took it from there. Okay, and uh, so let's let's come to you know the the Ghanaian system right now and uh, uh, a pathway that has been established in the uh, recent years is yes. you know Ghanaian players playing in Ghana for a little you know and then taking the next step 
into smaller European mm -hmm. clubs and uh, not so big leagues yeah. before they do make that big jump. In recent years, you know, we've had the likes of uh, Andre Ayew, Jordan Ayew, Christine Achu, yeah. and all these, basically the whole starting 11 of the Black, <laughs> Black Stars. Stars uh, yeah. what, what do you make of this type of, you know, jump uh, in terms of how you've seen the development over the years? I mean, it's good for everybody to play in Europe. Yeah. Right. Uh, the main aim of every uh, footballer is to be in the big leagues in Europe. Uh, I'd say maybe because of the development of the leagues here, people don't really value what we have. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think people trying to go to the big leagues, it's, yeah, it's a good idea. Not easy because you go into a country where they also have players who want to play in the big league. Yeah. And you have to be strong mentally to be able to just say, I'm leaving home to pursue a dream. Uh, over the years, we've had some really good players coming through, and as you said, from the list of the guys on the Black Stars, amazing players, uh, doing the nation proud, uh, very solid. I think Jordan, for the last couple of weeks, have been on like a scoring run, yeah. and like, everybody's yeah. talking about it. Uh, Thomas Pate at Atletico Madrid yeah. having an excellent season, and it's also good for the country overall. But then, I think with more people trying to go there. I believe if we're able to develop our leagues here, we would have a solid group of people, of players that we can use for the Black Stars too. Yes, yeah, certainly. But what, what, what do you think it would take to develop football here? Because it's been around for a while now, over 60 years or so. Yeah. Uh, but it feels as if there is still a clear disparity in terms of uh, the quality of the football and in terms of uh, the investment and uh, you know facilities. Yes. Uh, basically, on every front, there is a big gap between how it's played here and yes. how it's played there. Do you have any ideas in terms of how that gap can be bridged? See, I can say from my own experience working at Sporting, they have the Sporting Bible, where how we teach the kids it's defined for all the academies, sporting academies worldwide. And I think in Ghana. I don't think we have clubs who have an identity yeah. of how they want their players to be. Uh, we don't have the facilities that we had a conversation earlier in regards to there's been like a wonderful facility, but we need more of it. Uh, in sports, and we have that. We have uh, a structure. Uh, the problem here is also financial. We don't have enough investors invested in the sports. Driving around, I see people playing all the time on um, the clays, like with oranges, with socks. If we're able to build a sport and look at the long-term gain, having a proper structure, coming from the top to the very bottom, uh, looking at the grassroots and building the grassroots, having a uh, defined program for all the teams, I think that is, that is a start. From the very bottom, uh, all the teams having a defined program for themselves, trying to find an identity. From there, we can go on to the next ones, but we have to start at the bottom. That is the only way. Well, you did speak of you know driving around and seeing quite a number of yeah. kids and even grown men playing yeah. barefooted. And uh, you look at these players; they do have ambitions yeah. and dreams of becoming professional players. But a trend that we've been seeing uh, in the past few years is the fact that most of these players actually fall prey to fake agents and you know fake scouts who promise them big moves and end up you know losing some sort of money yeah. and you know uh, bad things happening to them yeah. uh, what's your take on that issue and what's someone out there watching who wants to become a professional what are some of the key things they should look out for in terms of you know these agents and scouts out there with agents I'd say it's wrong that people take advantage of uh, other people, or people trying to chase their dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll never tell anybody to stop following their dreams, always go after your dreams. But with agents, you just got to be careful because people are taking advantage of people yeah. and you have people who are actually working to make things happen. You just have to find uh, a credible source to work with and by that, I think the best is also going through the academies who have these agents that you can trust because the academy, the structures that you can work with the academy. Right? If somebody approaches you on the street saying, hey, I'm an agent, I can make things happen for you, I'll be careful. <laughs> very careful. Yeah. Very, very. What, what, so what about you know, the, the kids out there who were unfortunate to get into these academies with proper structures? Uh, literally speaking, the, the only source left is 
getting a move outside. from an agent uh, outside yeah. or someone scouting you somewhere. Yeah. So what what would be the possibility, you know, if let's say you fall outside the age range for an yeah. academy player, what, what, what would be the next step? Supposing you think you're good enough to still go pro. Depends on the age group. Uh, if you're still young enough, everybody's young enough to go to school. Uh, the best way is people are trying to get scholarships to schools in the States or in Europe where they still manage to play. And with that, we can be qualified for the MLS draft or even the CPL in Canada or anything in Europe. Because once you're in school, you're still playing, eyes are still on you. All right, so for us, we always preach education first and everything else second. So you have an education, something happens, you go back to it. If, Okay, you still want to play soccer, you have the education. Through soccer, you can make your dreams come true. But you just got to keep working and always believe in. Never stop. Yeah. Um, on, that, on that education matter, though, uh, for, for a long time in Ghana, I mean, if you look at two generations behind, probably running through the next one, yeah. you would have realized that education has been detached from football. Yes. And, you know, most footballers spend most of their developmental years yeah. you know playing the sport and uh, end up growing up to become footballers and there is that general lack in education even if you look at some of our players uh, in just the past generation and even in the recent generations yeah. some of them do not even have certificates yes. and educations to show that do, do you think that that is something that probably needs to change in the near future do you believe that down here and education is needed in terms before you become a footballer and how far should one's education go if they still want to become a footballer? I believe education is paramount to everything. Um, becoming a footballer doesn't stop you from getting an education. It's, I believe that it should be made mandatory for all players to be able to attend some form of education, get some form of education, attend some school, uh, grade 12 level, mm -hmm. at least should be basic requirements. Because for us, what happens if there's an injury? What happens to the life? Right? We have to realize that we're dealing with human beings here. They are not commodities, right? And if soccer doesn't work out, you have to still have something to fall back on. Even the greatest of all players still go back and get the education. You have players currently playing, still trying to get an education. You have, uh, let's look at basketball. Shaquille O'Neal went back to get his uh, degree. Education is paramount no matter what. We should be pushing for it. It should be made mandatory in Europe, the kids in the academy go to school in the morning and then come back to practice in the evening. In Canada, the kids who still play go to school and come back to play. So no matter what education is key, it has to be mandatory for not just the kids involved, but the whole nation as a, as a whole. I'm sure you've had the opportunity to assume the role of being a scout. You've worked with uh, various scouts and uh, you've been exposed to uh, quite a number of young talents and you know followed a lot of trials out there what, what do you think are some of the key features and characteristics that scouts out there look for players in trials uh, I think I'm just gonna break it into four parts where like, every coach or even scouts looks at uh, there is a technical and tactical part that everybody knows of you have to be good with the ball and all that stuff there's a physical part you have to be in tip nut shape to be able to play and then there's a social part where you have to be able to work with those around you and then the one part that a lot of people don't talk about is the mental part and the psychological part where we also look at the attitude of a player and we have those who think they're better than anybody else for those kind of players stay away but then if you're open to work I mean how you play and how you the things you can do on the field if you're going for a trial everybody can do that but what sets you apart is how you deal with other situations that come apart, how you present yourself. Seeing that shows you a different level to everybody else because everybody can kick a ball. Right? On a great field, everybody can kick a ball. How are you going to react when kicking the ball, somebody hits you? You're going to stop kicking the ball, you're going to fight. Because we want kids, not just kids, we want uh, kids who are going to grow to become men and men of value. So they're looking at that and then comparing it to just here to play a game, nah. Let's look for someone who has all these together and we can make something out of it. So you did speak of you know, the technical aspect 
and uh, the physicality and then we have the social and then you mm. said most importantly the mental mm -hmm. part did i get that right do you think the last one is the most important and if you could rank them how would you rank them uh for me if you could rank them if i could rank them it's very important to be mentally strong take ronaldo for example ronaldo was taken i wouldn't say taken ronaldo was scouted at the age of 12 from national in madeira and moved to the mainland lisbon away from his parents. How many 12 year olds can say, hey, I'm gonna leave home, go somewhere to pursue a dream? You have to be mentally in tip top shape to say, you know, this is what I wanna do at the age of 12. This is what I wanna do and I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna miss my parents, I'm not gonna miss my family, I'm not gonna miss my bed, the food I eat, to go there. Socially, to be able to deal with everything else, because they're two different places, you have to be there. So for me, those are the top two. Technical ability is gonna come with the practice and all that stuff, you're gonna develop it. And then you come to physically, as you grow, everything sorts out. So for me, physically is at the bottom, top two, uh, social and mental ability. So now we've tackled what the scouts out there usually look for in terms of the key features. Let's now come to uh, what exactly some players did during the trials that probably ended their dream or put these scouts off. Uh, let's talk about the don'ts. What players out there should probably not be doing in their next trial? First one, don't be cocky. Yeah. That's a given. Yeah. Uh, go there just to show what you have. Uh, there's a difference between being cocky and being confident. All right, there's a, just a thin line in between. How, how thin is it? Very thin, because the way people read you could be different. Yeah. It could be just very confident, but then people will be looking at it like, oh, this guy's way overconfident, right? But then it's, be confident in terms of how you talk, how you walk, how you show things, when you shake hands, nice, firm handshake, make eye contact, those little things. You're gonna be nervous no matter what, that's a given, but you know what? Enjoy yourself and have a blast. Yeah. After that, play. Yeah. Uh, next one, we already touched on the attitude part. Yeah. Just be happy and play. Yeah. Uh, some feel because of the understanding of the game, because they go there thinking, oh, it's just me, I'm just gonna show me. But playing an 11 v 11 game, it's not just one versus 11, it's yeah. 11 v 11. Yeah. So how do you make the next, one, uh, next person to you better? If you're able to make who surrounds you better, you make yourself better. And pe coaches see that, scouts see that, because they see that you have an understanding of the game that is unmatched. And I'll give an example of the uh, Napoli Inter Milan game from yeah. last week yeah. when Lukaku got the ball, dribbled through, made, started pointing for Martinez, and Martinez made a diagonal run that took the player away, creating the space for Lukaku because it was a 2v1. He makes that run, it was a 1v1, and it was easy. Both of them showing an understanding of the game in that very moment. It's something that I go to watch a bunch of kids playing, and I see a kid doing that or a kid. No, even don't focus on Lukaku. I see somebody making that run to create that space. Yeah. He doesn't touch the ball, but you know what? He's that's an assist for the goal. Yeah. Right. And those are the little things that people are always looking out for. Scouts are always looking out for. Coaches are always looking to see your understanding of the game and see how you make everybody around you better. So let's let's come back to you and your professional career. And uh, you know, so far being the head coach and you know technical director at uh, you know the sports and cp branch in toronto uh how how has that been exactly and uh, what are some of the challenges it's certainly not been easy you know being in the country all by yourself and now you're quoting quotes like the boss you call the shots it's not it's not always easy is it easy it's been fun but it's not been easy yeah. i think uh, nothing good comes easy there's challenges in everything you do yeah. it's how you decide to rise to the challenge or how you look at it if it's a challenge you just have to take it on uh, there have been some difficulties here and there but you know uh, I think the idea of being in charge and making things happen keeps me moving uh, for me the, the goal is to make the kids better I'm there because of the kids I'm not there for my personal gain yes I'm there to learn and grow but then it's for the kids if I'm able to improve a kid my job is done. If I'm able to improve a coach, my job is done. Uh, challenges, all the kids are not the same. Uh, 
Uh, Quality-wise, they're all not the same. Attitude-wise, they're definitely not all the same. But you know what? It's part of the job, and that's what makes us as coaches better. Uh, knowing how to handle each and every one of them, knowing how to handle each and every parent, knowing how to deal with all the things around uh, the environment, knowing how uh, to deal with those above me, and knowing how to uh, handle situations that might arise out of like nothing. It's all part of the challenges that I deal with, but then it's something that makes the job what it is. Right. Yeah, you did mention, you know, trying to manage these different breeds or types of players and, you know, mentality wise and uh, basically different human beings that yep. that could pose as the greatest challenge as a manager. But beyond that, as a coach, you are judged based on your results and numbers. And uh, to what extent has that, you know, affected you sometimes? Has there been a point where you've had to compromise because you needed to win? And you know you had to sub off a kid, or how far have you gone in terms of you know getting those results? See, uh, one of the reasons why I love working at sporting, uh, working the sporting environment is we don't compromise the development of a kid for results, right? And at parents' meetings, this has been said through all the years, and I've said to a lot of parents, we can lose every single game in the season as long as we don't lose our heads and we don't lose our cool, and the kids are learning and developing we're going to be fine. But then saying that, we believe if we do what we're supposed to do at a practice, we're not going to lose every single game in the season. <laughs> yeah. So it's a win-win for us. But for us, will I compromise the development of a kid for results? No. Has it crossed my mind? Yes, I'm human. When some games are going on, when you know, okay, it's easy to just put the big man up top and just hit long balls as a target player and just play. Or, okay, we win and let's just stay in and play uh, deep, keep the ball, let's whatever, kill time. All right, let's just play some good football. Let's enjoy what we're doing. Let's learn. Let's challenge ourselves. When the game is too easy, let's bring conditions. Uh, how many touches on the ball? Ball going through other channels, uh, sending crosses, going with the head, this kind of stuff. But to compromise the development of a kid for results, never. So you spoke of uh, some of the challenges with the job, but I'm pretty confident. You know, I've seen pictures of you uh, your team winning. You've had good periods with this uh, sporting team in Toronto. What would you say are some of your best moments as a coach? Best moments at sporting. Uh, over the years, there's been a few. Every year, there's something new. Uh, one of my best moments was at a, an academy practice where we're trying to do a simple drill, drop, kick, catch. Drop, kick the ball and just catch the ball. Uh, for some people, that should be super easy. For some of the kids, very difficult. Uh, we had a kid who kept on trying. The problem was he kept on using his shin to hit it and couldn't use his feet. And being able to do it, the joy in his face was amazing. Uh, there was also, it's always, for me, most of the best moments, it's not about just winning. It's about seeing the kids being able to do what they want to do. Uh, there was a kid from the U10 age group who kept on, the whole week, we kept on trying to do the fixed shoulder move. That's what he had to do. That's Messi's favorite move, drop one shoulder to the side and push the body to the other side. And game is going on, the kid is able to do it during the game. Like he stops playing, it's like, which time I did it. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, that for me was top. Uh, we've had, those are the great moments because you realize you're working with kids. You had a kid chasing a butterfly off the field. You know what, that's a kid, All right? At the end of the day, the men, uh, most recently, uh, Rooney's last MLS game in Toronto, I think DC United played uh, TFC and I was at the game. But before the game, we had some of our boys on the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing outside the field, uh, just watching everything. And I see a guy walk past me and I'm like, I know this guy. I know this face. Mm -hmm. So I just call his name, Gustavo, and I call him out and he looks at me like, Coach Sam, I'm like, what are you doing here? All in his suit and I've now dressed up. And he's like, oh, he's with the MLSE uh, accounting team. I was like, really? Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background story on that guy, he was our uh, goalkeeper for us at one point in time, with one of like a very bad attitude. Yeah. And I had a conversation with him, like, dude, listen, you're not going to play soccer for the rest of your life, but the way you're going, if you don't take care of yourself properly, it's not going to end well. And for him to say that day that that conversation was a wake-up call for him, 
and it kind of changes life around. For me, that's one of my best moments to, to know that I've been able to help a kid go from where he is or where he was heading, a very bad place to where he was heading to going up and doing something good. For me, that was tough. I'm sure, I'm sure you've also had some downsides and some bad stories to share yeah. as well. Uh, for us, for me and everybody involved at Sports in Toronto, uh, the darkest moment for us was um, June 4th, 2012. Uh, it was a Monday, 9.30, uh, playing a game where a 15-year-old kid, our captain by the name of Chris uh, McCurb and Parkin falls and dies. That, that for me was tough. Uh, it changed my view on a lot of things. It changed my view on life. Uh, life is not just about just getting results. Uh, There's a kid, a 15 year old kid who came in to play a sport that he loves, a game that he loves with his teammates. Came with his mom, mom went home alone, teammates went home alone. It was never the same. That changed how I see things. And it made me understand that not everything is a given. Let's make the best of what we have and create good moments. Hence why, yes, as much as I like to win, it's not about the results for me. You come, they give their best, they had a good time, not everybody's happy. Because you know what? You want to win all games. Understandable. Okay, Champions League World Cup, that's great. For eight year olds, nine year olds, ten year olds, three days from now, they would have forgotten about the game. We have teams win 16 0, 10 0. And we had teams lose 16-0, 10-0. Days from after the game, they forget about the game. But then they never forget how you made them feel. They never forget the joy they had on the field, the memories they created with their friends, all the things they were able to accomplish. Because the result is just the ice on the cake. I don't like ice and I like the cake itself. So <laughs> that's how it is. It's, there are good moments and there are bad moments. The bad was one of the worst moments ever in my life. And for any parents uh, to bury their kid. The best is seeing kids being happy and playing around with the kids. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, looking at the history of Ghana, most of uh, our great men, even our current president, uh, Nane Kufuado, you know, he's part of an entourage who went out there to gain experience and the knowledge and everything and they decided to come back. There are various names in the history of Ghana who also followed suit in terms of, you know, that pathway. What does the future hold for you, knowing that you're a Ghanaian? Uh, are you at some point looking to come back, you know, to start the academy that you wanted to as a seven-year-old or help develop Ghana sport? What exactly are your ambitions and how does it tie with Ghana? Home is where the heart is, right? And my heart is always in Ghana. Uh, the sport is, is an amazing sport. It's opened a lot of doors for me. It's helped me gain a lot of knowledge. It's taken to a lot of places. Eventually, I think one of those places is going to be back home because uh, it's for God, uh, man and country to help grow the sport here and bring back whatever we've learned because this is where I grew up. This is where I learned a lot of things and whatever I learned out there it will be best for me to also be able to bring it back and help somebody else because you never know who could be the next big thing. It could be found here. We've had some great players over the years and there's a lot of talent over here. Would I love to have my academy in Ghana in the future? Definitely. Somewhere in the mountains where the weather is <laughs> much, much better will be ideal. But yes, uh, in the future, who knows? But I'm definitely coming home sometime. All right, coach, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having you. me. I'll be, I'll be looking forward to, you know, sending my child to your academy <laughs> at the mountains. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Every kid is always welcome. <laughs>